What would it be like to live on a planet traveling around a star so huge that, in comparison to it, our sun looks like a tiny speck of dust? Well, you could find it out if you managed to visit a planet orbiting WOHG 64. It's a red supergiant, an enormous star dwelling in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy located not too far away from our home Milky Way Galaxy. Red supergiants in the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds provide an excellent opportunity to observationally test the current stellar evolution theory for massive stars. WOHG 64 is likely the largest star we have found so far. It's a real heavyweight emitting an incredibly bright light. To understand the sheer size of this mega star better, let's put it into perspective. Compared to our star, the radius of WOHG 64 is around 1,540 times bigger. In other words, it's like comparing a tiny grain of sand to a basketball. If we placed WOHG 64 at the center of the solar system, the surface of this star would extend past the orbit of Jupiter, swallowing up Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter itself. You see, the average radius of Jupiter's orbit is around 1,000 times the radius of the Sun. As for Saturn, the radius of its orbit is around 2,000 times the radius of the Sun. That's why WOHG 64 with its average radius being 1,500 times the radius of the Sun, fits right in between. Oh, and if you spread out the star's dust envelope, it would cover a distance of about one light year, or 5.88 trillion miles. The star is not only ginormous, but also immensely bright. In fact, it's one of the most luminous stars we know of. Luminosity is the total amount of energy a star emits per unit of time. And the light, coming from WOHG 64, is around 282,000 times brighter than the light from our sun. But perhaps one of the most amazing features of WOHG 64 is the dust envelope surrounding it. In 2007, astronomers, with the help of the Very Large Telescope, discovered that WOHG 64 was surrounded by a torus-shaped cloud it's so thick that to some extent, it obscures the star. The dust envelope is made up of the material the star has expelled, and it contains between three to nine times the mass of the sun. The star we're talking about was discovered in the 1970s by Bengt Westerlund, Olander, and Hayden. That's where the WOH in the name of the star comes from. It's an abbreviation made up of the first letters of the discoverer's names. By the way, Westerlund also discovered another remarkable red supergiant, Westerlund 126. It was spotted in a massive star cluster called Westerlund 1 in the constellation of Ara. But back to WOHG 64. Scientists have noted that this star lies very close to or even beyond the Hayashi limit. It is a theoretical constraint upon the maximum radius of a star for a given mass a condition where the inward force of gravity is matched by the outward pressure of the gas. By now, the star WOHG 64 has reached such an evolved state that it can no longer hold on to its atmosphere because of super low density, high radiation pressure, and relatively opaque products of thermonuclear fusion. That's why its average mass loss is among the highest known to us so far. It's unusually high even for a red supergiant. WOHG 64 also shows an unexpected spectrum of nebular emissions. The hot gas is rich in nitrogen and has a radial velocity more positive than that of the star, which is quite an unusual phenomenon. The star might have a potential companion, an O-type main sequence star. If it turns out to be true, then WOHG64 will be classified as a binary star. At the same time, so far, there have been no confirmations of this theory partly because the intervening dust clouds make the examination of the star very difficult. In any case, UOHG64 is absolutely fascinating, not only because of its huge size, but also because of its unbelievable luminosity and mysterious dust envelope. It's a great example of how unexpected and amazing our universe can get. Besides, such outstanding large stars are undoubtedly an important astronomical observation. 
the results of studies of such objects correct the restrictions on the properties of stars within the framework of modern models. For testing the applicability of models, the exceptions to the rules are most valuable. Spotted! It seems like two giant stars were caught in the middle of a romantic kiss. This sounds a little bit like paparazzi fodder at first, but we're actually talking about a cosmic twist an international team of astronomers has discovered. So, the life cycle of a solo star is relatively simple. They're born in vast, gassy areas of space, burn through their fuel, and at some moment, they explode as supernovae. But when stars are born relatively close to each other, their gravitational pull can cause them some troubles and captivate them into what seems like an eternal dance. In some moments, they come so close to each other that they're practically touching. These stars may spend billions of years circling each other, but their kiss lasts for a few million years only, which is just a blink of an eye in cosmic terms. The lead author of this study was on a mission to find these binary stars caught in such a cosmic kiss. He focused his search on the Tarantula Nebula, a beautiful star-forming region located in the Large Magellanic Cloud which is 160,000 light-years away from our home planet. And there it was, the shiny double star system that stood out from the rest. The two stars found there were pretty big and nearly the same size. Together, they make a mass of about 57 times larger than that of our Sun. Before this, we discovered only three other binary systems with a large mass. And since these two stars were so close to each other, they created an intense gravitational pull. This made them orbit each other at a staggering rate of once a day with their centers a mere 7.4 miles apart. With the stars being so close, they formed a bridge where their fuel could mingle, allowing for around 30% of their total volume to be shared between the two. Temperatures of this system were crazy too. At first, it seems the internal mixing of their energy might make these stars live longer as it allows for more fuel to be burned and for longer periods of time. But this is just a temporary benefit. There are two most likely scenarios for the star's ultimate fate. They could merge to form one giant star, which would eventually explode into a supernova. Or, they could each explode separately and live out their remaining years as black holes orbiting each other. If they merge, this process would probably take around 600,000 years, while if they become binary black holes, they could continue burning for another 3 million years. But both scenarios would ultimately lead to their destruction, unless the stars could end up as two separate black holes drifting away from each other through the vastness of space, there's a possibility for that to happen too. There's something spectacular stargazers across the globe could see recently. Jupiter and Venus, the two brightest planets in the sky, ended up so close it appeared like they were about to collide, or as if they were kissing too. At least that's what it looked like from here on Earth. In real terms, they're still 400 million miles away from each other. Here's another interesting thing astronomers like to talk about, G-objects. Those are celestial objects that look like clouds of dust and gas, but behave like stars. At the center of our galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole. It's 4 million times the mass of our Sun, and recently, scientists found out there are two mysterious G objects that hang out pretty close to that black hole, so-called G1 and G2. And the most probable theory is that G2 are two stars that were orbiting the black hole in tandem and merged into an extremely large star cloaked in unusually thick gas and dust. During G2's closest approach to the black hole, it showed a strange signature. It was elongated and much of its gas was torn apart. As it got closer to the black hole, it lost its outer shell and now it's getting more compact again. The thing that has everyone excited about the G-objects is the material that gets pulled off of them by tidal forces as they sweep by the central black hole. 
this material must inevitably fall into the black hole, and the result is an impressive fireworks show. This happens because the material eaten by the black hole will heat up and emit radiation before it disappears across the event horizon. An event horizon is that scary boundary around a black hole from which nothing can escape. Now, it seems scientists have discovered four more G objects, and they're all located within 0.13 light years of this black hole. And it could be that all of the six objects used to be binary stars that got together and merged because of the powerful gravity of this giant black hole. Usually, it takes over a million years to finish the merging process between two stars. We definitely want more G objects because it's one of the rare opportunities for us to study how things behave near a supermassive black hole without being swallowed, yet. Have you heard of variable stars? Look up at the sky. We often think of the stars as unchanging, eternal lights. Yes, some stars might appear constant, but others change in brightness over time, which is why we call them variable stars. Some of them dim and brighten again over days, months, or even years. We can't see it with the naked eye. We're talking about changes astronomers can only notice using equipment and over longer periods. And how about vampire stars? Imagine two stars, a red giant and a white dwarf in a binary system, swirling around each other like cosmic ballet dancers. The red giant, which used to be a vibrant and fiery star, now has aged and grown tired. Its outer layers of hydrogen, which were once held tightly by its gravity, have now weakened, making it vulnerable to the smaller, denser white dwarf. The white dwarf, known as the vampire star, thirsts for the hydrogen fuel that its larger sibling holds, and it sees a great chance there. As they spin together, the vampire star uses its powerful gravitational force to steal the hydrogen from the red giant's outer layers. The vampire star glows with a blue hue, looking full of energy and more youthful and vibrant than its aged dancing partner. Not only vampire stars, the horror continues with zombie stars too. Sometimes when the red giant explodes, it doesn't completely break up into smaller pieces. Instead, a white dwarf remnant is left behind. It's basically a zombie star that was gone at the moment but has risen back to life. But this isn't your average zombie hungry for brains. No, this star hungers for the very substance that its vampire sibling had been taking from it all along, hydrogen. And if the zombie star is close enough to its victim, it will start sucking material back in to start its core again. It will become a hydrogen explosive, ready to go boom in a spectacular show of cosmic revenge. It's a fascinating phenomenon. We usually won't even manage to detect it because these explosions are much fainter than the usual supernovas. But when it does happen, the resulting blast is truly epic. And it destroys both the vampire star and its zombie sibling. It seems vampires and zombies may not be a work of fiction after all. Not only are we made of stardust, but we're also more similar to stars than we thought too. For example, stars also like to hang out with their close group of friends. Most stars prefer to travel through the universe in clusters. It's a group of stars that end up bound together by gravitational force. The stars in the cluster are mostly made of the same age and type, hobbies and interests. I guess even they have better social lives than I do. What would the Earth look like if it was born in another solar system? I did a little research for you to find out, and the results were surprisingly wholesome. There are some warm tropics, strong winds, and giant dragonflies. But okay, let me explain from the very beginning. Since 1995, NASA has discovered more than 4,100 planets outside the solar system. Unfortunately, most of them are either flying ice balls like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter. But there are still as many as 161 planets similar to our Earth. And one of them is very close to us, 
in the Alpha Centauri constellation. There are three stars in this constellation. Two of them are called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you've probably seen them. They're very bright. Because of that, they look like one big star. They rotate around each other very slowly. And there's the third star, chilling around not far from them. It's a teeny tiny red dwarf, Proxima Centauri. It got its name because of its proximity to our Sun. This star is the most interesting one, so let's talk more about it. Proxima Centauri is only 4.5 light years away from us. Oh, and one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Yep. If we went there, it would have taken just a little over 165,000 years of traveling in a space shuttle. Oh, you think that's a lot? For the universe, it's like checking on your fridge. Proxima Centauri is much lighter and much smaller than the Sun. It's also two times colder than the Sun, with a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. That's why we can't see it without a telescope. On the bright side, though, it will burn for trillions of years. And you don't have to worry that one day it will eat us like our Sun. And yes, our twin planet is located right next to Proxima Centauri. This planet is called Proxima b. Yeah, I know, they got creative with all these names. I hope you won't get confused. It's slightly larger and more massive than the Earth. This planet is located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. It means that there can be water and even some microorganisms there. Yes, it's possible that one day we'll find some life there. But right now, we don't know much about this mysterious planet. It's probably a rocky planet like our Earth and has a similar landscape, but this is just a theory. Who knows what kind of jokes the universe can throw at us? It would be a shame to fly 165,000 years just to stumble upon a giant piece of ice or something. Fortunately, we probably don't have to wait that long. The big brains are now developing a technology that would allow us to move at the speed close to the speed of light. If they succeed, we'll get to Proxima b in just 20 years. But anyway, this video is not just about Proxima b. It's about what would have happened if life had originated not in our solar system, but in Alpha Centauri. What if we were orbiting Proxima Centauri or the other two stars? So now, let's imagine that the Earth has replaced Proxima b. I'm going to call this new planet New Earth. Guess I'm not very creative at naming either. First of all, the orbit. The new Earth must be about 25 times closer to its star than Proxima b is. Otherwise, it would be unimaginably cold. Let's move the planet a little closer. Excellent. The day still lasts 24 hours, but our orbital period is very high. Proxima b revolves around its star in 11 days. But we'll make it in just 8. Hey, a birthday party every week? Sign me up! Oh, hold on, there's another problem. You see, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. This means that sometimes, just out of nowhere, it throws out some stellar winds. These winds carry around a bunch of ionized particles, which then settle on the planets. Yeah, our Sun also does that, but Proxima Centauri tries to finish us off 2,000 times harder than our Sun. So the radiation levels are off the scale, to say the least. Don't worry, it's fine. All we need are incredibly strong magnetic fields. They will help us create a very thick atmosphere that can protect us from the Proxima Centauri's tantrums. So now it's going to be very warm. Or not. Another problem. Scientists are still not sure how exactly Proxima Centauri's planets rotate around it. What if they turn out to be tidally locked, like our moon? Then one half of the new Earth will be a frying pan, and the other half will be some frosty deserts. Oh, it's fine, we'll just settle down somewhere in the middle. Didn't expect that I would ever say this, but it will definitely be warm at the North Pole. And if we're lucky with the rotation, we'll just get a cozy, warm planet. The average temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there aren't any extreme temperatures. On the new Earth, we have much more water. The weather is generally pretty crazy. Some very strong winds and quite destructive rains that can go on for quite a long time. But you can adapt. 
Temperature changes are much more noticeable in the mountains. Just like on Earth, the higher you climb, the colder it gets, except it's very cold right here at the top. Because of this, the mountains and hills have jungles below and snow-covered deserts on the tops. But in general, it's almost like the Earth's tropics. The flora is very rich, the trees are very low but lush. The thick atmosphere also makes flying easier, so there are a lot of large flying animals, like dragonflies with a wingspan of 16 feet. Uh-huh, moving on. The sky here is much lighter than that on Earth and very cloudy. Sometimes it may seem completely white. But the starry night is beautiful and bright. There are four suns. Our main one is Proxima Centauri. We can also see two bright Alpha Centauri stars. And finally, our old sun, which looks like a bright, distant star. I'll allow you to shed a tear for the old Earth. There's a few planets near us, like Proxima Centauri C. The host star is surrounded by two belts of cosmic dust, so get ready for some gorgeous, colorful night views. So what we have in the end is a little crazy, but a beautiful green planet. I personally wouldn't mind moving there already. What about you? Write in the comments. Alright, so now we know what would have happened if our Earth had been born near Proxima Centauri. What about the other two stars? Unfortunately, we won't be able to rotate near two stars at the same time. Scientists suspect that Alpha Centauri A and B have some kind of common planet that jumps from one orbit to another. But it's probably very cold. Let's choose Alpha Centauri A. Just like on the new Earth, here our average temperatures are about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, the temperature variation is quite large. It goes from negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the South Pole to 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator. Eh, we'll be fine close to the north. The day is still 24 hours, and the orbital period is one year and one month. It's almost the same for the Alpha Centauri B, but the orbital period is about half a year. Other conditions are very similar to those on Earth. Changes in the seasons are almost not noticeable. The temperatures don't change much either. No matter where we settle down, the neighboring star will be clearly visible, but we probably won't see Proxima Centauri. And that's about it. Of course, all this assumes perfect conditions. Just like on Earth, one slightest change, whether it's a thin atmosphere or a bigger distance from the star, and it won't end well. We got really lucky with our Earth. But even so, the chances of finding a habitable planet are very high. Even with the tiniest possibility, there will be about 15 million planets in our universe that we can find life on. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century. But modern studies of Eta Carinae estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carinae releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way, Eta Carinae is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. 
it increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare-ups, Eta Carinae has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carinae, is quite dim as seen from Earth. But it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Placed where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table, and when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close, or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before. Many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. 
So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light-years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in the star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000-plus light-years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. More than one million Earths can fit in our sun. New research shows that between 20% to 35% of suns eat their own planets, and a quarter of planetary systems orbiting stars like the sun had a chaotic past. The very thing that gives life can also take it away. All the planets in our solar system revolve around the sun, and they all do it in a somewhat consistent way. It's most likely that they stayed that way ever since they first came into the picture. But not all of them. This chaotic existence means that a solar system had a lot of planets in the litter until the host sun decided to melt them away. Our solar system is panned out perfectly so that no planet's gravity interferes with each other. The gravitational force on Jupiter is a lot tougher than Earth's, which means that if Earth gets close to Jupiter, we'd be another moon for Jupiter. The planet is so big that if Earth were the size of a grape, Jupiter would be the size of a basketball compared to it. 
Even with the best technology in the world, it's difficult to tell if stars do, in fact, eat their planets. The best way to study this is to observe binary systems. That's just a sciencey way of saying a system with two stars orbiting each other. Usually, the two stars were formed around the same time, from the same gases, and the same conditions. It means they should contain the same elements, more or less. When you open your eyes in the morning, the sunlight that's been traveling for millions of miles greets you. The closer we get to it, the hotter it is. But the rays traveling from the sun also contain certain chemicals that make it unique. The chemicals that are associated with the sun are light materials like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and helium. You can find some other stuff in it too, but these are the main ones. By studying these elements, you can learn the history of a solar system with enough detail to determine if it was chaotic or smooth. Scientists studied 107 binary systems composed of suns like ours by analyzing the light. Since each system contains two suns, they compared and contrasted them to see the differences. They observed the stars with a thin outer layer, having different elements than their companion. All suns contain light elements, but there are some that have rocky elements, like iron, silicon, and titanium near the sun. These elements are associated with rough terrains that you'd find on the surface, but they're out there floating in the middle of space. The thinnest outer layer is especially rich in iron compared to the other layers. Many stars are twins at birth. Even most of the Milky Way stars have a buddy in a binary system. It means our sun is pretty unique for not having a partner. But there are some theories out there that suggest that the sun may have lost its twin in the past. It's around 184 light years away and is called HD 186302. And this might be our lucky star. A stellar nursery is where thousands of stars are born. They're made up of gas and dust that gradually collapse under their own weight. Our sun may have started in such a way 4.6 billion years ago. And when they're mature enough, they go out into the open, usually with their travel buddy. Actually, scientists claim that up to 85% of all stars could be in binary pairs or have more buddies, but over 50% are dual pairs. The only problem is that we can't really see it since it strayed from its original orbit an eternity ago. But traces of it can be found in the Oort cloud. That's the vast cluster of space consisting of comets, space rocks, and ice in the outer edges of our sun's reach. They float around quite a lot since they're far off the sun's gravity and can easily be knocked out of their orbit into open space. Flying through such a space is no different than flying through any random void of space. The reason why some of these light elements in space contain rock elements you'd find on the surface of a planet is because the sun knocked them off their orbit and devoured them as they got closer. It also happens when a star becomes too big in its place and starts eating everything around it. According to scientists, if a star eats a planet, it can make it go chaotic and spin so quickly that it eventually rips apart. But don't worry, there's a very low chance of the sun devouring the planet in the near future. Stars are formed when a huge cloud of hydrogen and helium grows until it collapses under its own weight. The pressure increases and reaches extreme heat levels we can't even measure. Eventually, the hydrogen atoms lose their electrons, causing the hydrogen to fuse together and release energy, countering the gravity collapsing. But when the gravitational force overpowers the hydrogen fusion, the star begins to expand and becomes a red giant. And then, after around a billion years, the hydrogen in the outer core will go away, leaving plenty of helium hanging around, which will fuse with the rest of the elements around. And once all the helium disappears, gravity will shrink the red giant into a white dwarf. And when it's completely gone, the remains of the star release tons of gas and dust into space. Scientists claim that our sun has between seven to eight billion years left before it reaches that stage. But even if that becomes a reality, it wouldn't happen overnight. Something like this takes millions of years to take place. But what if the sun decided to devour us overnight as we speak? The planet would start feeling hot in seconds. Every slight degree change can lead to some catastrophic events. Ice caps can melt in a matter of seconds and flood the coastal lands. 
even little islands in remote areas of the world will be submerged. And as it gets hotter, every snow-capped area will melt instantly and turn into desert-like climates. Some places will burn, and your everyday objects will melt on the spot. The Earth's interior will also get hotter, allowing volcanic eruptions to happen across the world. Antarctica will melt from the heat, as well as the volcanoes erupting inside. And just in a matter of minutes, the whole planet will turn into fire and ash before it explodes into tiny bits floating in space, reaching areas we've never even heard of. But no worries, something like this won't really happen. In case the sun knocks us off our rotation, the results would be different. It'll also get hot because the magnetic field around us protects us from the sun's radiation. And once we get knocked out of place, the magnetic field gets tarnished and the extreme heat from the sun will boil us. The gravitational force will be unstable, so the physics of our everyday life will be chaotic. We'll have to wait five billion years from now when the sun turns into a red giant. It'll grow in size, eventually eating up Mercury and Venus. Chances are, Earth will also be on the menu. If Earth were to move only 900,000 miles closer to the sun, then it would be uninhabitable. It may seem like a lot, but it's only four times the distance between the moon and Earth. Detecting the chemical composition of the sun rays in solar systems that are further away could help scientists find other Earth-like planets. Since the atmosphere around these planet-eating stars changes the chemical composition, we can detect which solar systems out there have had a calm past. The main thing we have to observe is if the planets have a healthy orbit cycle. With nothing else getting in the way, we can assume that the planet could follow the same steps as Earth did for humans to be here. But this process will take ages, since there are millions of nearby stars similar to our sun. The odds of finding a planet similar to ours are near impossible at this rate. But if so, then there might be life on those planets. There will be no way of knowing if it's intelligent life, but they might have had the same evolutionary fate as us. Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, plop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. 
Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system? These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it, so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh, now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that, but it has a mass comparable to the sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, 
and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light, so it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our Sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the Sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the Sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth, and then it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny. A powerful burst of gamma radiation lasted a mere half second, but it released an enormous amount of energy. It was more than our sun would produce in 10 billion years. This brief flash lit up the whole sky. Afterward, a much softer and more long-lasting glow replaced it. Astronomers examined the phenomenon with X-ray, radio, optical, and infrared waves. It turned out that people had finally seen a newborn magnetar for the first time ever. It was likely formed after two neutron stars had merged. It resulted in a kilonova, one of the brightest and largest stellar blasts. Its light finally reached our planet on May 22, 2020. Imagine a massive star, at least five times the mass of our sun, reaching the end of its life. It might be because it's run out of its nuclear fuel. If it happens, the star starts to cool off, the pressure inside drops, and the gravity starts to squeeze inward. And then, more than a million times the mass of our planet collapses within 15 seconds. It happens so fast that an enormous shock wave causes the outer part of the star to blow up. It produces a blinding burst of light. This powerful blast is called a supernova. What's left behind is an incredibly dense core with a huge cloud of hot gas, called a nebula, expanding around it. If the star has been massive enough, more than 10 times the size of the sun, it's likely to turn into a black hole. If not, it turns into a neutron star. It's basically a giant nucleus, the central part of an atom. These stars are mostly made up of neutrons and are rarely larger than 20 miles across. For comparison, our sun is almost 865,000 miles across, which is 109 Earths put side by side. But don't let this relatively tiny size fool you. Any neutron star is at least one and a half times heavier than our sun and has an intense magnetic field. If you scooped just a teaspoon of this star's insides, this matter would weigh more than a billion tons. It's so dense that it makes neutron stars some of the most extreme objects people know about. The next stop is the black hole itself. When two neutron stars merge, they most often create a new, much heavier one. Within milliseconds or even less, this star collapses into a black hole. But the astronomers who examined the flash of light recorded in March think there might be another outcome. They're almost sure they saw something never observed before the birth of a magnetar. That's a rare form of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field. It's 1,000 trillion times stronger than our planets. This field is also so powerful, it heats the star's surface up to 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. To put it simply, magnetars are the most powerful magnets in the universe. 
their magnetic fields can seriously mess with the neighborhood. Atoms, unlucky enough to get close to such a star, get stretched into pencil-thin lines. If you somehow found yourself several hundred miles away from a magnetar, it would end badly for you. The magnetic field would first disrupt your bioelectricity. It means that your nerve impulses wouldn't work anymore. Even your molecules would change under the influence of the star's field. In the end, you'd pretty much vanish. If a magnetar flew within 100,000 miles from our planet, it would wipe out all the data on every single credit card in the world. Hop on board! Hurry, we don't have much time! We're on a cosmic journey to find the biggest star in the universe. The first star we pass is our own sun. By far, not the biggest one out there, but it's still massive. You could fit one million Earths inside it. That means if you think of the sun like a basketball, Earth would be half the size of a pencil eraser. If we put all the planets on one side of a scale and the sun on the other, the planets wouldn't stand a chance. The sun makes up 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the entire solar system. Mass is basically how much stuff or matter something is made from. And it's what you can thank for stars shining. You see, the more matter in a star, the thicker and hotter its core becomes. This starts a chain of chemical reactions. Hydrogen atoms get smashed into each other to form helium releasing an incredible amount of energy. That's the star's light and heat. So, bigger stars also equal brighter ones. But with all those reactions going on, this shortens a star's lifespan. When it starts to run out of fuel, the star will enter the giant phase. It'll expand and turn red. Which brings us back to the task at hand. The biggest star we'll find is likely to be on the edge of its life. Switching on our hyper-light engines, we soon arrive at the Lumen 16 system. Here, we'll find one of the smallest stars out there, a brown dwarf. Small here means about the size of Jupiter, but they're small for stars. Brown dwarfs are also called failed stars because they don't have enough mass for those chemical reactions. That means they're not as bright, but they're super dense. All the matter in them is packed together so tightly, they weigh 80 times more than Jupiter, even being the same size. Huh, and if you think that's something, just look at a white dwarf, even more tightly packed. This one here is Sirius B. It's also about the size of Jupiter, but it'd weigh as much as the Sun. It emits a dim white light. Once it runs out of gas, it'll turn red and cool down. Now let's fly closer to its giant neighbor, Sirius A. You easily see this star from Earth. No telescope needed. Twice heavier and more than one and a half times wider than our Sun, it's the brightest star in our night sky. Now we fly 550 light years away from Earth to the constellation Cassiopeia. Almost a hundred years ago, a cosmic explosion happened here. It expanded the atmosphere of the star Gamma Cassiopeia and some gases were thrown into space. After that, it became the brightest star in the constellation. It's ten times wider than our Sun. On to the famous North Star. Funny enough, different stars have had this title over the years, and more will take it in the future. That's because Earth's pole star changes every 26,000 years. Imagine our planet like a spinning top. The northern pole will shift around in a little circle, pointing at different stars to the true north. The current one is a supergiant 37 times wider and 5 times heavier than our Sun. It's easy to find in the night sky. It's on the very tip of the Little Dipper's handle. Get ready now! We're setting off for the eye of the storm, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. To see the next star, we need to switch to infrared mode. This pistol star is hiding from us in space dust. In just 20 seconds, it emits as much light as our home star does in an entire year. And its size is jaw-dropping. It's 420 times wider than the Sun. But it's still not the most luminous star known to humanity. That would be a blue supergiant in the constellation Triangulum. Meet B416. 
it's almost 10 million times brighter than the sun. But the brighter a star, the faster it burns up all its fuel and the shorter its life. Compared with a red dwarf that barely glows and burns fuel much more slowly, its life will be hundreds of thousands of times shorter. 3,400 light years from Earth, there's one of the rarest celestial bodies in the universe. It's a yellow hypergiant called Rho Cassiopeia. Among the countless stars in our galaxy, there are only a couple dozen of these. And even though this star is extremely far away from our planet, you can still see it in the sky without needing a telescope. That's because it's 300,000 times brighter than our sun. It also helps that the thing is 900 times wider than our home star, too. And its color tells us that its fuel reserves will last for a long time. When Rho Cassiopeia starts to turn red and expand, it'll be one of the biggest stars in the entire universe. Now, we move to the constellation Orion. The star is in our sights. Betelgeuse, one of the largest ones visible to the unaided eye. 700 times the size of our sun, if it took our star's place, its surface would touch the asteroid belt. That's between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. It would engulf the four inner planets, Earth included. But this star has astronomers very excited. They predict Betelgeuse will explode in a fantastic celestial show in the next 10,000 years. It'll be the greatest astronomical event of all time because we'll be able to observe a supernova at a close but safe enough distance. The exploding star will shine as bright as a half moon. It'll be visible in the daytime sky for a year and at night for several more. Now we venture to stars that exceed the sun's width 1,000 times. Mu Cephei is a hypergiant boasting the title of the reddest known star. Its color tells us that the fuel gauge is getting closer and closer to empty, but it's still so big that it could hold a billion suns in it. And because of its mass, this star will eventually become a supernova or even a black hole. Let's take a trip of almost 4,000 light years from home. Here it is, a red supergiant called VY Canis Majoris. It's one of the biggest and brightest stars of the Milky Way. It could fit 3 billion suns. And even though it's so huge, this thing is surprisingly light, only 17 weights of the sun. In the context of celestial bodies, you could call this star an inflated balloon. In the next 100,000 years, VY Canis Majoris will explode in a hypernova. Gamma radiation will destroy all life in the local part of the universe. But this star is so far from our solar system that it wouldn't mean any harm to us. If we placed MY Cephei in the center of our solar system, it would bulge all the way out to Saturn's orbit. To remind you just how far away Saturn is, think of it this way. It takes the sun's light eight minutes to reach Earth. To get to Saturn, it takes well over an hour. Compared to this massive star, the sun is just a grain of sand. It's one of the most luminous and reddest stars in our universe. The bigger and redder the star, the closer it is to its end. So we're not looking at just a titan of the universe, but also one of the oldest celestial bodies out there. The second biggest star in the universe is UI Scuti. It's about 1.5 billion miles wide, 16 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is a pulsating variable star. Its brightness changes about every two years. UI Scuti is a record breaker in fuel combustion per year. Scientists expect it to evolve back to hotter temperatures like a yellow giant. Our journey is coming to an end. Before us, we behold Stevenson 218. It takes 20,000 years for light from this star to reach Earth. It's hard not to see this red supergiant on our tiny terrestrial home. It's 2,150 times wider than our sun. We'd need 10 billion suns to fill its volume. For comparison, the average beach contains only about 5 billion grains of sand.